one. It says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing God's will, and may God work in us what is pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. It's an amazing prayer. It's one of those prayers that we should pray for our own lives as well as for the life of our church. And, and this is, uh, the, starts out with the word now. Now may the God of peace. That may indicates that we have a choice. That yes, we're asking God to do it. We're of course not demanding God to do it, but we're asking God to do it. But then in our own life, are we willing to say, God, may your will be done in my life. That word now also is in there, and, and now is a connecting word. A lot of translations use but, others use the word, and the NIV chose now. I like that it chose the word now when you look at the connection of it and what it's doing, because for several reasons. One, it's not telling God, now God, you got to do it, because it says now may God do this thing. So we're not demanding of God. But that now also is an indication of, okay, we've gone through all this, now let's put it into practice. The other thing with the word now is it, it gives us that sense of timing, that we don't have, wait for it, that it's a present issue, not a future one. Are we willing to allow God now to begin this work in our life? Now that we've heard the word, now that we've heard these things of scripture, now will we ask God to apply it to our life? It gives that sense of urgency, and I know we often procrastinate on things. Sometimes pro procrastination, we find out, isn't so bad because if we procrastinate long enough and there's no repercussions and it kind of slips away, you're like, whew, I didn't waste my time on that. But there's other times we know that procrastination can cause issues. I know for me, it's like just once I sit down to study and prepare, I'm good. I can write and rewrite and read and do all I need to do. But getting to that place to stop. Sometimes I'm finding all these little tasks to do. In fact, our first assistant that we had, he was an assistant principal uh, for special needs kids. And so he would come into me and tell me, stop procrastinating and go work on your sermon. <laughs> so we need those, those things. They quit procrastinating. Time to get to it. We need to move forward with it. And that's what he's saying is, now, let's not procrastinate anymore. Let's start allowing God to work in our life. And he starts out by addressing our God of peace. By God of peace, he's telling us several things. First, that word peace obviously means peace, but it also means quietness, at rest, at oneness. We are at one with God. Because we're no longer at war with God, that we're friends of God, then allow God to work these things in our life. We're not enemies. And as stated before, that this is all because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, we have this sense of a place of rest in the presence of God, not of fear. God isn't to be feared. To be worshipped, revered, and honored? Absolutely. But the whole sense of being fearful of God isn't what we need to do. Too many people have that fear that if they don't do something just right, God's going to strike them. God wants the best for you. God is not out to destroy you. And so we realize that this is God's idea from the beginning of time. God's idea was never to destroy humanity or he would have done it. God's purpose has always been to bring reconciliation. And so we see that he's making it clear how then God is our God of peace. How does that work? Well, he's, a based, he's our God of peace based on our covenant relationship with Christ. He says, through the blood of the eternal covenant. Through the blood of the eternal covenant is how we are at peace with God. And we think, wait, eternal covenant? But when the writer wrote this, wasn't it just a few years earlier, possibly two or three decades earlier, not later than 70 AD? So didn't this all happen just recently? The whole cross thing? How is it the eternal covenant? How does this work? Well, the writer of Hebrews, that's when I like the book of Hebrews so much because he takes us there. The writer, or they take us there, we don't know who wrote it, but we know that the writer took us there to know that this God is, has had this plan all along. 
Go to Hebrews 1, and it starts talking about the eternal covenant of our God from the foundation of the earth, showing us that God always knew humanity was not going to hold up to the plan that was going to be there. And God knew God, his, that there was going to need to be a plan to reconcile people back to God. So we understand that God saw this from the beginning of time, and it's revealed throughout Scripture to us. We know of the story of Adam and Eve. When they fell and they disobeyed God, they were ashamed. They felt naked in the presence of God because their sins were being revealed. And what did God do? The first creature recorded that was slain on this planet was that of a lamb. And through the shedding blood of a lamb, they received covering. See the thing, pattern here? See the foreshadow of what God was thinking? And then we move forward to Abraham. And Abraham, had Abraham done today what he did then, Child Protective Services would have been at his front door. But Abraham was told, sacrifice, but Abraham, your son, your only son. Does that also sound familiar? Abraham was following God's plan, and Abraham was going to go through with it, but God stopped him, and what did God do? God provided a lamb. Through that shed blood's lamb in place of Isaac's. The writer of Hebrews tells us this also. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 is, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall all your offspring be named. Abraham considered that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, Abraham did receive Isaac back. That's faith. That is a step of faith to think, here is the son that you promised me. You're now wanting me to lay it on the altar and sacrifice it to you. I know you and I believe you, so I don't think you're going to let this be the end because at this point, Abraham would have been over 100 years old. Sarah would have been in her 90s. The impossible would have even been more impossible for them to have a replacement for Isaac. Besides, it was Isaac, he said, would be the descendant. So Abraham's response was, God, I will obey you. And I trust that if I do sacrifice my son, you'll bring him back to life. That was such a step of faith, such a foreshadow of Jesus to show us what was to come. Later years, when Moses then rescues the children of Israel from slavery and they're at the mountain, he gives them this, the law that tells them, these are things that are not pleasing to God. These are things that are harmful to others. And as Jesus has said, and Moses said at first, but confirmed, was that the whole law is covered in the whole saying of love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So that whole list of 313, 613 laws was to let us know we're not holy enough to be in this presence of the holy God. And so what did God give to Moses? Said So then to help people who are going to stumble in these things, they're not going to be able to fulfill all these 613 laws. Let me just tell you, I'm going to give them a sacrifice that they can put their hands on that animal, transfer their guilt onto that animal, and that guilt will take the punishment for them. Sound familiar? Again, the author in Hebrews 9.22 said, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So we start seeing this eternal nature, eternal plan that from Adam and Eve to Moses, Abraham to Moses, then we get to Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene and we know the story of how he goes to the cross and sheds his blood for us. We are then told, and so we've gone to Genesis, let's go to Revelation. In Revelation chapter uh, 5 verse 6, John has a vision of the slain lamb who is alive forevermore. Now, it's not that Jesus looks like a slain lamb. It was just a symbolism to help him see that that which had been killed is now alive for all of eternity. 
We see from that, then we understand whenever this writer of Hebrews says, this is an eternal covenant that was established from God from beginning to the end. This is how it's all going to be brought together is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That it is to show us that this is why we have a God of peace. If it was not for the shed blood of Christ, we wouldn't have peace with God. We would be an enemy, an enemy of God. But this has bridged this gap for us. So going back to 1320, the shed blood is then what allows us to have the peace of God. We're going to look in a few moments, or in the book of Romans uh, 8, it tells us that there is a division between us and God because of sin, and how Jesus sealed that for us. Now I love the fact that he doesn't stop with a dead Jesus. The writer of Hebrews goes further. To say, not only is this sacrifice given for us, but shows us that he is alive. He rose again. It is a resurrected Lord that we serve, not one still hanging on a cross. It just gives us that added confidence. And, and I know, we look at modern science and we're like, well, yeah, but to go through all Jesus did, there's no doubt Jesus was dead. To be raised from the dead, that's logically impossible. That's scientifically impossible. And so it can cause doubts. A lot of our friends and loved ones kind of like, well, I don't quite get that because it just can't be. Who raised him from the dead? God. Who created all of this? God. So if God created all of this, then isn't God above nature? And if God's above nature, can't he change nature to work according to God's plan? That's why scripture says, with God, all things are possible. Because God doesn't live in this realm that we live of having to follow scientific rules and things to exist on this planet. God created it. God is above it. And besides, we have to walk by faith, not by sight. If Jesus still walked the planet, 500 people saw Jesus alive. They saw him ascend into heaven and told, Jesus will come back. We've given that promise. But people say, well, why? You know, that's just a cop-out that he ascended into heaven. It's like, you know, so they can say, well, he probably just was not doing well and, and actually did die, and that's why they buried him somewhere else. No. God is greater than all of that, but it's the fact that if a 2,000-year-old man was walking around this earth, now there would be some doubters, because you're always going to have doubters, but the most people on this planet would see and believe. But we're called to believe, then you'll see. As we believe, then we see the resurrected Lord in our heart and in our mind, and we like, God, scientifically I don't get it, but I believe and I know your word is true, and I know the impossible is possible because of you. And Apostle Paul affirms in Romans 4, 24 and 25, he says, But also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in God, who raised Jesus, our Lord from the dead, Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins, and was raised to life for our justification. This is why we have peace with God. So yes, all glory and honor and praise is going to God, and then this writer refers to Jesus then as that great shepherd of the sheep, which confirms what Jesus told us in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives up his life for his sheep. As the good shepherd would wrestle that which is evil and go after that which was being destructive to his sheep, or her sheep, it was the thing that we see with Jesus has done that for us. He has gone against the ultimate enemy, the enemy of our soul. This is why verse 20 reveals we have peace with God. So we understand now why we have the peace of God, but now we look at the next role of then how does this apply to us? Well, if you take out that part within the commas where it says, and now the God of peace will equip you. Now may the God of peace equip you. So we start seeing then in verse 21 with this connection that because we have a God of peace, God equips us. Our prayer, and if we follow this prayer, is saying, God, help me to be equipped. Are we willing to say that prayer? Are we willing to know that God sends us out into this world and God has prepared us for this work? Each of us have a role to play. This verse now takes it to an external role that, yes, we have accepted Christ in our life, and it's not just for me and Jesus got our own thing going. 
It's because of Jesus, I'm going to be out into our world and help our world. We're called to do good works. Now, many get this confused. And they seem to think, well, if I do good works, I'll go to heaven. No. It's not how it works. We do good works because we're followers of God. We aren't Christians because we do good works. We good, do good works because we're Christian. We've got to get the order right, because otherwise we start thinking it's all about me, but we're never going to be holy enough in the presence of God. Ephesians 2.10 says, And God made us what we are. In Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works, which God planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. Doing good is God's plan. That is God's will for us. Are you doing good in this world or are you stirring up stuff? How are we living? Are we doing the good things we should? Now, I like this new century version that I read because that translation basically agrees with Lady Gaga. God has made us what we are. We are made this way. We know it. It's no doubt about it. And I know some Christians get bent out of shape over that when we apply it to LGBTQ, but we know it's true. Well, God created me to be a liar. No, you chose to be a liar. We didn't choose. <laughs> I've, LGBT, I've yet to meet an LGBTQ person that said they chose to be LGBTQ. It would, my life would have been so much different had I not been. But it's those things that we see that God created us. This, the way God has created us, you, me, all of us, for a purpose. God had a plan for us and equipped us in, with that so that we can be able to show God's love to people, to a lot of people who are told God doesn't love them. It means we got a lot of work to do, that we have a job to fulfill. And in our announcements, you're going to hear, hear of another opportunity you get to do that to help others know about this love of God. But here again, this passage is a summary. This prayer, he's summarizing everything he's done. Because we look back at Hebrews 12.1 when we talked about running a race set before us. So now he's saying, and pray that God equip you. God set the race, so pray God equip you for the race. God has set the course, and pray God will equip you to follow it through. God trains us in this course. And I love what he, Hebrews 13.5 reminds us because God will never leave us nor forsake us. So on our journey, there may be some difficult times, but realize this is the course God has put us on and to help us and know that we're not alone in it. God's already done the work, and now we have to find our way and our calling to how we do the good works we're supposed to do in this world based on this path that God has given to us, and each of us have a different path. Each of us have been called differently by God. Each of us been called to do different things in this world. But God has a plan for us and doesn't send us out and expect us to just figure it out. God brings things in our life to help us develop us. That means God will stretch us. And there are times where we're going to think, God, I cannot stretch anymore. And God's going to say, watch. He stretches just a little bit more. And we don't break. God is there. God knows how much we can go through and what we can put up with. And there are things that, that I have faced in ministry that I never imagined having to face. They didn't teach us this stuff in seminary. They didn't even teach us about city plannings and those permits and all. It's like, that would have been a helpful thing. But you know what God does is God brings people around to instruct you and help you in that journey on those things you don't know. This re verse reveals why God equips you. Did you see it? Why does God equip you? Well, my God just wants me to be happy. I've heard people say that. God just wants me to be happy. Where do you get that? So your whole purpose in life is to be happy. And God's whole purpose for creating you existing is to make you happy. Really? So you're wanting a God who's a genie. You say, God, I'm not happy, fix it. And God says, okay, I'll fix it. That's often how we look at God, and then whenever the shadows fall, so does their faith, because it didn't work the way they had hoped, because their God only wants them to be happy. 
No. What does the writer say? The writer tells us God equips us to do God's will. Our purpose in life is to do God's will. We are servants of the Most High, and that means there are going to be some tasks we don't like to do. People are messy. Those of us on the usher, or on the usher team and myself as well understand how messy it is when we've all had our chance of cleaning up out in front of our sidewalk out here. And some of it is pretty darn disgusting. We didn't sign up for this, God. Yeah, but I called you to make this place appealing for those who come in. So, yeah, that's part of it. We don't like it, but it's part of being equipped. And, and often people say that they don't know what God's will is for their life. And, and so that I ask, well, have you prayed for God to direct the jobs you have, the place you live, your finances, your relationship situations? Have you prayed for those things? Then you're inviting God in to those areas of your life. So as those things start happening in your life, then apparently God's directing that because you've committed all of that stuff to God. Proverbs 3, 6, in all your ways acknowledge God, and God will make straight your paths or will direct your paths. So we understand then as we invite God in into those areas of our life, our jobs, our homes, our finances, our relationships, everything that we have, we're saying, God, I'm acknowledging you now direct my path. And God says, all right, I will. So your life, just living it, is part of the will of God. Do we misstep? Yeah, quite often. More often than I like, even to myself. But God is greater than our missteps. And yeah, we may cause some obstacles in our path that God could have directed us around had we been a little more sensitive to God. But God gets us back on path because we've asked God to do that. God has made us who we are. God made us with the talents and the gifts and the abilities. God put you in the job you're in, in the neighborhood you are in, in the community that you are in for a purpose, for a plan. It's not coincident that you are where you are and what you do. If we've said, God, direct my path, God, help me find the right job, we trust God is directing our path. But it is sometimes difficult. In yesterday's devotional, My Utmost for the, His Highest, Oswald Chambers stated, the goal of the missionary, which is follower of Christ, is to do God's will. Not to be useful or to win the lost. Wait, aren't we supposed to be useful to win the lost? But he goes on to say, however, a missionary, a follower of Christ, is useful and does win the lost, lost, and that it is not the goal, but the goal is to do the will of God. So we don't judge our will of God based on how many people are we bringing into the kingdom of God. It's not the number of notches you have in your Bible for those you brought to Christ. It's about are you doing and being what God wants you to do and be. And I know when I was a teenager, I questioned, God, I don't even know what your will is for my life. I'm not even sure. I mean, here I was the president of the youth group. I was teaching class once a month. I was organizing events. I was the uh, chauffeur. We piled more kids into a car than is legally allowed even back then. I mean, it was you chauffeured everybody everywhere. And I'm like, God, I don't know what your will is for my life. I was doing that and didn't realize it spiritual enough. My friend Terry had an excellent voice. When he sang and people were moved by his singing, I'm like, well, it's obvious what God's will is for him. I don't know what God's will is for me. And now look where I am. So it's those things that obviously God knows and does things differently. Even if you may feel your role isn't visibly public as others are, you are doing God's will if you're where God wants you to be and you've included God in your their thinking about it. There is the whole teaching of knowing that there are different gifts that God has given each one of us. And back in 70s, 80s, the, the church really went off on the gifts of God. So we had the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, which to those who aren't evangelical or Pentecostal or charismatic kind of scares them. But we talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We talk about the office gifts of Christ. And then we talked about the motivational or creational gifts. And 
They're all in scripture, they're all there, and they are divided into the, the Godhead of how each one operates in each, but the creational gifts are those from God the Father of what we're created to be. Some are teachers, some are administrators, some are um, servers, all the different things and roles of life, they're part of us, and we realize, okay, so I'm doing what I'm comfortable doing, then that helps me know I'm in the will of God. We don't need to make it such a difficult thing. And if you're still struggling and wondering, God, I don't know what to do for you, just watch for open doors. Well, God, I'm getting a little long in the tooth for this. Moses was 80, and no one here I know of is 80. So, you know, there's still time that God may open up a huge door for you. So don't give up. We just keep doing what God says. And so we are called to be equipped. And then lastly, we see the prayer that God then works in us. So it's gone from the external of us doing for others and doing good deeds around us to God works in us. This work leads us to now pleasing God. Again, not in ourselves are we able to please God. It's through Jesus. It tells us it's through Christ that we're able to allow God to work within us well, Jesus has ascended into heaven, but Jesus sent the Holy Spirit back. The Holy Spirit is referred to in Scripture at times as the Spirit of Christ. So that Spirit that was in Christ is now within us, so we know Jesus is with us to do the things that we need to do and change the things in our life that we need to go through. So in this passage where we're told that, again, in Hebrews 13, 5, God will never leave us or forsake us, God sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is with you to guide you and help you to become that person inwardly that God knows you can be, and it will show in the outward the way we act, the way we behave, the things that we do, and so this part is covered in those passages we looked at in the past few weeks. Hebrews 12, 4 through 11 talks about how God shaped us through discipline. That was a tough one, because we don't like to be thinking about the discipline of God for things in our life, but it's through that discipline that God points out those areas that we need to work on, never in judgment or condemnation. That's the difference between conviction and guilt. Guilt makes us feel bad for what we've done with no hope, whereas conviction of the Holy Spirit says, you know, when you said that or when you did that, you hurt someone's feelings, you offended someone, you didn't do what I wanted you to do, it was unloving toward me, and then God doesn't condemn us for it, shows us this is how you can do better. Encourages us to move forward, to become a better person. And then in Hebrews 12, like, which one did I get to? Oh yeah, 12, 4 through 11, that was 4 through 11, sorry. Hebrews 12, 14 tells us, live at peace with everyone, and be holy. Okay, now, how do we do that? How do we live at peace with everyone? Because some people are just difficult to deal with. But it does say in there, as much as it is up to you, live at peace with everyone. So don't you be the one causing disruption. You can't control other people. You can't control what they do or how they act. But according to you, do everything you can to help people live at, to live at peace with one another. And that gives us a little bit of hope knowing that God is then there to help us to live in peace when others aren't. That holy part, well, we've talked about that. Our holiness is because of Christ, because we know in ourselves we'll never be holy enough. Scripture says our holiness is like filthy rags compared to God's holiness. Now, we're good at comparing ourselves with other people around us and think, well, I'm at least better than they are. Well, that's not who we compare ourselves with. We compare ourselves with God, and we're on come up short. So when we're to be holy as God is holy, we think, Ugh, give up, I can't do that. But God's given you the Holy Spirit and will guide you and help you and shape you as you need to go. So since our holiness is in Christ, then we allow the Holy Spirit in our life. And then in Hebrews 13, 1 through 17, he just gave us some exhortation about living out love. Love those you don't know. Love those you do know. Love those who are oppressed and help them. Love those you're in relationship with. And don't get too caught up with your love of money, because that's not going to get you anywhere. 
And so we start looking at this and thinking, okay, God, these are things you're working for the inside out. This is to guide us, to help us grow and develop within our life. And yes, this is a prayer inviting God into our life to do these things. Are we up to saying this prayer? Are we willing to say, God, my life is yours, whatever you need to change, whatever you need to do? And you know, when we add, when we say amen at the end of the prayer, what we are saying is, so be it. We are in agreement, God, that is what I agree with you. So when you say this prayer, can you add your amen to that of saying, so be it, God? Because that may mean we may some, face some interesting times as God does the work of shaping us into the person we need to be. But we don't give up hope. We've got the assurance God will never leave us or forsake us. <clears throat> so thankfully, this writer doesn't leave us feeling overwhelmed, though some of those passages were tough. And some of those things we may think, God, I need to work on. But the author closes reminding us, you got a God of peace. You have been secured by the eternal covenant because of Christ. He is not a dead Lord. He's risen from the grave. And because of that, God is sending you out, but God's not sending you out alone. God will equip you to be able to do what you need to do. And that far, as far as inwardly, the things that you know you need to change and address, the Holy Spirit's there to help you as well. So this whole journey is one of faith, of hope, and strength, and knowing that then we can say as that the author did at the end of the prayer, to God be glory forever and ever, because it's God who's making this happen in our life. This writer is encouraging us to allow God to continue to work, because we are serving a God of peace, and who is equipping us, who is with us who is transforming us into the image of Christ. So I'm going to read that verse one more time, and if you want to repeat it after me, or just say, agree with it, say amen. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing God's will. And may God work in us what is pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. And God's people said, amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you help us, that we're not in this journey alone. We thank you, O oh God, how the writer of Hebrews has helped us look at Hebrew scripture and combine it with the Christian scripture and see how this just merges together so beautifully because, God, you are the God of all creation. So, God, we ask that you minister to our needs where we are. Help us with our sense of, of, of um, steps of faith, God those areas where we may need to grow and develop in our walk with you and the things that you've laid before us. Help us to know that you have laid out the path, but you're going to equip us. Help us with those issues in our heart and life that we know are still needing work, just that confidence that you are there to help us to become the people we need to be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, we will take prayer requests. Um, let's see if anything online... Uh, don't have anything here. Um, anybody else have a prayer request? Yeah, Vic. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, w I would just like to pray for my grandparents who are in their 90s right now. Uh, I would like to just pray for their health okay. and happiness. We do have one online. Like so. Yeah, we have uh, one prayer online from Brian. Uh, for He's traveling to Vegas tomorrow to visit his boyfriend for a week. He'll be driving. Pray that the Lord will guide my way there and back and keep me safe. Okay. All right. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you that you are there for us and you guide us and direct us and you just continue to minister to our heart and life. We pray for um, Vic's grandparents, oh God, that you be with them in their uh, later years. And God, we ask that they be golden years for them, that Lord, that you provide them the, the strength and health that they need in their body. And God, we know as our bodies start getting older that things don't work the way they used to. And God, that you help them as they adjust to that change of their life. And God, just help them to provide for their needs Help them, O oh God, to be able to enjoy the years they have left. And God, we ask for safety and protection over them. 
And God, for Brian, as he travels, we thank you, O oh God, that you are with us in our journeys. Uh, you're ahead of us. You're beside us. You're behind us. So, God, we ask for that protection for him. Allow his time with his boyfriend to be a, a good event for him this week. And let it be a time of them just uh, re, uh, kindling their affection and love for one another. God, we ask that you minister to each one of us, O oh Lord, that may have needs that we didn't want to express out loud, but you know what they are, and we bring them before you. We ask for your healing power, your guidance, your financial guidance and support. And, oh Lord, we, you know each heart and each life. And God, we, and we also pray for the food that's being prepared for us today. Lord, we ask that as we enjoy a time of fellowship and as we um, raise some money for our building fund, oh God, that, Lord, that also you just allow it to be a time of nourishment and strength, not only physically, but also in connection and community with one another. We thank you, God, for your blessings. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Better, better. First of all, we want to welcome anybody who's here for the first time. We are glad you're here. We invite you to be with us constantly, occasionally, any time that you're thinking about it. We're here. We're always there. You will find in the seat back pocket little cards here. Uh, it just gives us a, 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 an idea who's coming, who's going, how, we, how you heard about us. And if you're online admin at christchapel.com. Let us know that you're out there. Let us know that uh, you are liking what we're doing. What we, we hear enough about what we're not doing, right? So a couple of nice things wouldn't hurt at all. For those of you that are also here, we also have these cards. It's, they call them ministry cards, and it's, it's if you want to volunteer for something or if you have a question, you have a testimony, you have a prayer request you didn't feel comfortable about talking about. Use this. Uh, these two cards will go in the brown box on that table there and we will get them to the appropriate uh, ministry leader. Again, for those of you online, admin at, uh, at Brian, what, what church are we here? You have St. Monica's? I don't know. Uh, admin at uh, Christchapel.com. Um, Bible study. Still, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, conference room. We're there. I brought donuts last week. Nobody ate them except me and Pastor. Thank God our hips can go ahead and take that. So, we also appear on Zoom, but you don't get the donuts there. So, but hey, we're, we'll take you any which way. We are still in Revelations. We are now up to chapter 8. Whew. Yeah, we only got 97 chapters in the book. We're getting there. But no, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be through sooner or later, but we're learning so much. And if you thought you knew about Revelations before, or you think you knew about something about Revelations, I learned something last week that still shocks me to my core. But my pastor said, so uh, it, it's, been, it's been very, very fruitful. Uh, next on the list, oh, hey, Cyclavia last week, amazing. We had a great turnout at the booth. We had um, a people working the booth that weren't scheduled to work the booth, that worked longer at the booth, that worked shorter at the booth. But those of you that did help out, whether setting, tearing down, in the middle for five minutes, ten minutes, or three hours, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are do, helping and doing the ministry of Christ Chapel in here in North Hollywood. Um, I'm going to deviate, no, to keep that, I'm going to deviate just a tad bit here. Um, we have all heard at some time, Matt, uh, read the book of Matthew, <laughs> where it talks about, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat, you were with me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink, I'm with you. You gave me, you invited me in, you clothed me when I needed to be clothed. Um, sorry, this really gets me because I think we're really doing the work here <clears throat> in North Hollywood with our hygiene bags. There's a box back by the table there that we're collecting things of a hygiene nature for a homeless ministry. There's a sign-up sheet over here, but the, that sheet will also give you an idea of what we still need. And we do need a lot of things, a lot of hygiene things that you don't really think about all the time. But when you are, if you are un, unhoused, and you're living in, in North Hollywood Park there, there's things that you don't have your, 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 uh, your uh, hand on. And then 
to further to further um, the need of, of, of here here in our in our community of Los Angeles. Last Friday, the 15th bus arrived with immigrants. Now, whether or not you are for immigrants, not against immigrants, you have strong issues, you have light issues. The fact is that 23 families with 13 children, for a total of 45 people, <coughs> pardon me, arrived here, and there is an organization here that is taking care of them. They're clothing them, they're feeding them, they're getting them shelter. But I think everybody was a little bit surprised at the fact that there were so many children coming. Matthew 25, Matthew 18, 5, 18, 15 says, and whoever welcomes a little child, this is in my name. So in that light, starting next week, we're going to start collecting toys for the children to give to this organization because quite frankly they ran out. They were surprised. They didn't hear about you know, that people would come with kids. So we're talking about, there's a little flyer, again, that back table is going to be busy tonight, okay? But we're talking about things like Play-Doh, coloring books. You can't get big trucks because you don't know where they're going to be traveling to. So they need something like creative things that will make their mind going. I think, um, uh, I think I saw over in Target, they actually, the Target over here in uh, North Hollywood, they actually have a section of Spanish language choi toys. So the goods, you know, I was thinking Uno, that everybody plays Uno, no matter how old you are, whether you're four or you're 104. That's me and my granddaughter, but that's a whole different issue too. So we're going to start that next week. Same box, it's going to be emptied with all the hygiene things, because that's the last week we're going to be collecting the hygiene things. <coughs> Pardon me. So, um, like I said, if you, if you can, remember that we are commanded in the Bible, the New Testament, that we are to give of ourselves, whether it's time, talents, money, and everything in, in between. Um, today, building fundraiser. I know we've been collecting the building fundraising for a while, and Olga always wonderfully gives us something um, wonderful to eat. Bobby is her, her sous chef, who also did all these little, little festive little things that he does. And, uh, you know, we're really blessed here. And it may not physically look like we're doing much with that money, but there's so much things behind the scenes. You have no idea how the amount of permits and the amount of meetings and the amount of offices that pastor has to visit to go ahead and fill these things out to get this stuff done. We're getting very close to more permits, but we're also getting close to finally getting the, the, the permits to go ahead and finish what we need to do. Well, start slash finish what we started to do several years ago. So please do remember that we are having this fundraiser today. $10 is a suggested um, donation that's going directly to the, um, to the building fund. And, uh, well, the, the board member is going to be here collecting money right, right around here. So that's another table that's going to be very, very busy today, too. So line up. Um, today, while we're um, chomping at the bit here, eating and whatnot, we are going to have an officer from the um, North Hollywood Police Station come over and as much as we think it's so horrible that we have to do this, we have to do the run, the hide, the fight. It's sadly, it's a part of our, it's a part of our, our culture now that we, we have to be one step ahead of the game. So please stay around for that as well. Um, offerings. <laughs> I mean, what kind of church would not feel offering? We have Zelle. We have Bank Autopay. We have Mail a Check. We have Take Cash Money. I know, who pays in cash money anymore, right? But we will. And there's a, back bo a black box on the back wall. We have to keep our boxes separated because, you know, they don't get along very well. So, um, so uh, you can put your donations in there. If you're using an envelope and you have a specific thing, whether it's the building fund or the, uh, the, the, this, that, or the other thing, mark it on the, on the, on the, on the envelope. Otherwise, we just think it's tithes and offerings, and we use them wherever God joins us. So if you will, join me now. <laughs> Father God, first of all, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we have a church right here in North Hollywood <laughs> that, Father God, we can come to each and every Sunday, each and every Wednesday, and any days in between. So, Father God, we ask you to bless those that can give, and those that can't give, we ask an extra special blessing that, that they will eventually get to the point.
whatever they possibly can give. But we also ask, Father, for the cheerful giver. We thank you, we praise you, and we ask you to bless this food for the nourishment of our bodies. And all God's children said, Amen. Get started too is we are going to have a models of pride booth it's at the california science center it's from 10 30 to 6 30 it's for kids our students ages 14 to 24. uh we're gonna the booth is going to be they're changed the prog program this year so we'll have the booth all day so there's a sign-up sheet in the back for uh, models of pride uh, we've got to divide them two and a half hour shifts and it just gives us a chance to let uh last time i saw the list we're the only Church of our uh, house of worship present, so it's a good place to let the youth know that they're accepted and loved by God. So help with that if you can. Please stand and join us for our last song. <laughs> Enjoy it. Enjoy the fellowship. God bless you.